Hello, this is uh, Eric Kopito, Civil Net, and we are honored to have as our guest today, Professor Gyorgy Derlugan, who is one of our favorite guests, uh, to talk about the current crisis in Artsakh. It will be our primary topic, and we'll talk about other topics, obviously. Uh, very good to have you on our show, Professor Derlugan. Thank you. Uh, obviously, there's the crisis at the moment. Uh, what we've had since Monday morning, when the agents of the uh, Aliyev's regime uh, posing as environmentalists have closed the, the, the road, the primary road that connects Goris to Stepanakert. Uh, there is many speculation about where this comes from. Uh, is this essentially moving 2025 to 2022? Is this his steps towards uh, his final, his version of the final solution? Or is this uh, just another tactical fight in a long war? Both, like in a protracted war. And so this is a totally predictable crisis. The form, let's grant it, you know, was inventive. You know, so this time is going to become, I'm afraid, you know, a long-lasting joke, Azerbaijani environmentalists. Uh, I somewhat feel pity you know, because there, there are some genuine environmentalists in Azerbaijan, and their protests are dealt as brutally as any protest in Azerbaijan. So this is particularly bad joke, you know, to present busloads of protesting Azerbaijanis. Uh, it's a familial sultanistic regime. So of course this is very much orchestrated. How could this be orchestrated? So the idea probably is coming from uh, some think tank, local, maybe international. Uh, a lot of resources are going into. Uh, the psychological warfare in Azerbaijan. And this time, uh, they are trying a different tack. Notice, you know, that last time they tried a surprisingly brutal, massive, deliberately murderous attack on Armenian positions in Armenia proper. So in September, they opened fire, uh, fire in the middle of the night. Heavy artillery, so it was not some sniping, because it was heavy artillery and directed against the uh, Armenian barracks you know, to kill as many boys in their sleep as they could you know, and then start advancing. So that was on the scale of sort of typical Nazi invasions in Second World War. That produced very unexpected result. Although uh, we could have expected you know, something strong, you know, some reaction from the West, because the world has been moving, you know, we are dealing with a picture with lots of moving parts. And since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, and this is the major background condition there, which is not directly reflecting in Karabakh, but in more, uh, more complicated and less predictable ways. Because in, at the, on the surface, Azerbaijan proclaims itself to be an ally of Ukraine, actually, and supply to Ukraine some uh, humanitarian equipment, uh, fuel, and there are reports, you know, we don't know how much it's pl planted propaganda of Azerbaijani units, actually, volunteer units fighting on the Ukrainian side against the Russians, which, is, which would be quite surprising and you know, quite, quite defiant. On the other hand, Azerbaijan is, uh, has become you know, a major conduit for uh, the, what they call, gray experts of Russian gas and oil. So you mix it up and it becomes Azerbaijani brand and it could go uh, through Turkey somewhere to Europe. And many people in positions of power are willing to turn a blind eye to such shenanigans. And of course, uh, Azerbaijan is very important also as a conduit of imports, you know, beating the sanctions against Russia, you know, so buying something uh, ostensibly for a Turkish company, transporting it through Azerbaijan. It's kind of typical shell game. It's not that it is uh, impossible to follow, but when you do it so many times, you know, so every hour you create another shell company, uh, this is an old-fashioned way of uh, circumventing the sanctions. Therefore, Azerbaijan is empowered. You know, so they feel, the, Ilham Aliyev must feel you know, that he is very much in luck. And he must be using this luck, you know, not to mention, of course, the exceptionally high oil and gas prices. So he must be using this luck. Uh, 
so this is totally predictable uh, because uh, in the longer run uh, Armenia has much better prospects you know just as uh, the position of Armenia and especially the position of Artsakh is extremely vulnerable now it is almost certainly growing in the longer run and the opposite is dynamic applies to Azerbaijan you know just as formidable you know, it might look at the moment you know because they have uh, not just uh, Turkey on their side but Erdogan you know they have Russia and Putin you know who are at least uh, willing to tolerate certain behaviors of Azerbaijan and make concessions to that because they desperately need it and because because Aliyev's regime is, uh, will run out of oil or maybe even before uh, some new uh, energy sources would make oil obsolete. You know, so of course in 10 years from now uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan you know, might be in very diff uh, different positions and therefore he must act now. So this is all very predictable here. Yeah, well, I think it's very interesting you say that because actually, uh, according to the IMF reports that was signed off by the Azeri government itself, by 2030, they become a debtor country. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in the reports that they have essentially approved themselves. And uh, I think the IMF was predicting a uh, 2050 uh, per capita income of $6,000. So, uh, and, and a very, very low growth rate. Uh, let's move on to the, the, the big, uh, big 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is Russia. Uh, there's two uh, schools of thought that uh, this crisis is coordinated. It's a one-two dance between Baku and Moscow to bring down the current government because the greatest blackmail of any government in Armenia is the prospect of an ethnically cleansed Artsakh that will cause a political shock, if not certainly bring down any government, especially if it's a violent type, genocidal type, ethnic cleansing. Uh, that is what many people think. And then there's others who think this is simply Russian weakness, that Russia uh, cannot even do its most basic rudimentary things. Uh, everybody has their opinions about this. Which one of these two do you think are right or are they both have elements of truth in them. These are hypotheses. Like a hypothesis must be formulated in a testable manner, not as opinions. I'm not dealing with the opinions here uh, as such. Uh, overall, the situation looks reverting back to 1989-1990. It might sound at first surprising, but uh, Mr. Putin is moving uh, towards a position in history which would be comparable to the position of Mr. Gorbachev. They might look absolutely the opposite. In fact, Mr. Putin uh, proclaimed as his major goal, you know, his, uh, his destiny was to reverse the defeat uh, which Gorbachev had allowed in his time. However, look at it, you know, step back and look at it somewhat differently. Both of them decided to revitalize Russian power and re-establish it on new foundations in world affairs. So Gorbachev was thinking that it would be through humanization of Russia and world affairs. Uh, Putin thinks that the opposite, and it's through brutalization. Both were supremely self-confident and at first to remind you again, you know, just Gorby was the darling of the West and the whole world for how many years? For five years. You know, uh, that's a pretty long time, you know. Okay, but Putin was the boogeyman of the West again, you know, for how many years now? You know, almost 15, uh, if not longer, you know, definitely since 2014. And then both of them mess up in major ways. Uh, both of them stop listening to the advisors, you know, they uh, go for very daring gambles. And once the gambles start misfiring, what in the CIA jargon is called the blowback occurs, uh, they fall into a very strange inaction. And this is when we saw uh, much ethnic cleansing in Azerbaijan back in 1990. 
And eventually Moscow would be taken uh, almost openly by 91, you know, the site of Baku, because that was still a pro-communist regime, pro-Russian regime. Uh, while in Armenia it was openly anti-communist and, and Armenia under Ter Petrosyan began drifting elsewhere outside the Warsaw Pact, outside the Soviet Union potentially. And Armenia was forming uh, an army, de facto several armies by, uh, at that time, outside of the Soviet uh, Union framework of power. So that I visited Yerevan in May 1990, I came back to Moscow and said that Soviet Union is finished. Nobody wanted to believe me. So it's a typical Armenian exaggeration. I said, well, I saw how two fraternal republics within the Soviet Federation are waging pretty much a regular warfare against each other. And the central army, the Soviet army at that time, could do pretty much nothing about it. And at most, you know, they took sides. Sometimes different units of the same army took different sides. Actually, what we also saw, you know, the, that was probably for mercenary purposes, some commanders trying to make money before to remind you, you know, that in the mess, and by 1991, you know, some of those commanders were proclaiming themselves not Russian, but Belarusian or Ukrainian, you know, and we haven't heard any uh, orders yet. You know, from our national capitals, therefore we stay where we are, where we've been uh, deployed before, and we do, no, nobody has oversight of what we do. Do they sell weapons, you know, do they do some fighting on the other side? So let me remind you, you know, that this was a mess, it was very brutal, but there would be 1994, and you know, Armenians would organize. So right now we are in a situation when we, uh, where we can only guess how capable is Russia of pursuing another proactive operation. I doubt that it's probably very, uh, very high capability because it looks like, like in any crisis, and Russia is definitely in, in crisis, the decision-making um, chain shrinks. And in the case of Russia, it probably shrank to one single person. He messed up, he must be taking dec making decisions, and he starts to strangely disappear, you know, like he's cancelled annual news conference, which was such a gala event year after year, which has become a tradition. Uh, so something mm, ominous uh, is happening in Russia. And therefore, I would rather suspect, uh, I would rather put more weight on the hypothesis that Baku is testing, actually, you know, what Russia would tolerate. So uh, what would you do? Yeah, hey, you know, you have 2,000 peacekeepers there. Uh, you would shut off your gas, you need it more than us. You know, so, and that's why um, Baku is emboldened. And let me remind you, you know, so Russia must be the biggest frustration of both Baku and Ankara, because in, 19, uh, in 2013, in Syria, uh, Mr. Erdogan was already on the cusp of taking control over, or becoming you know, the hegemonic in Islamist power over the Arab Middle East. Because you know his people were coming to power in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, uh, and in Syria they were stopped by the Russian intervention. In 2020, uh, at least it looked to uh, to many Azerbaijanis, you know, that they were about to completely win the war. Uh, this excludes, you know, the possibility that Armenians could have continued waging guerrilla warfare in the mountains in winter conditions that could have dragged on for a while and could have potentially dif different results. However, you know, the, uh, we're speaking now about the feelings in Baku. The feelings are that their victory was stolen and it was stolen by a Russian bear. So I don't think you know, that uh, we can reduce the relationship between Baku and Moscow, although these are two petrostate dictatorships, you know, but we cannot reduce it just to being a puppet and master. And so I think uh, Baku regime is trying to achieve its goals in its murky environment. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to move on to uh, a character, an individual that has stepped in and I think has actually become a central part of this drama, which is Ruben Bartanian. Mm. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and since yesterday, uh, and actually today in the media, uh, he has actually put in a rather interesting uh, take about uh, the need for an international airlift sort of a Berlin-type airlift 
for, to end the blockade of Artsakh, which obviously is a distinctly political thing. Uh, because an airlift, uh, uh, the, the moment that the first international flight uh, lands in Stepanakert, this issue becomes internationalized and it's not a plaything between Baku and Moscow anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of his call? And, uh, and what do you think of his role at this point? And how do you see this playing out if the situation drags on and it gets worse and the images become uh, intolerable image-wise for the West? Oh, here we're getting personal. And I actually welcome your question because this needs to be spelled out. Uh, I'm encouraged by the scorn and conspiracy theories that uh, uh, Ruben has been reaping not only in Baku propaganda, but in the Russian official. Now everything in Russia is official or controlled officially in, in, in the newspapers. Uh, so, uh, as well as in the rumor mill, which is just silly rumor mill of Armenian uh, Facebook. You know, silly because uh, people with supreme confidence proffer what they cannot know. <laughs> you know so, I'm uh, always much humbler at this, you know, saying I'm a professor, I must be smart enough to know that I don't know. You know, it's wonderful, you know, listening to all these people who say that Ruben was dispatched by Putin to uh, Artsakh with a special mission. What could be conceivably that special mission? What is there in Artsakh that A, Russia needs? Russia needs a foothold in the Caucasus, obviously. Doesn't it already have it? And second, are they securing it with their military and all the military might which is standing behind them? So if that military might is suddenly in doubt because of their performance or underperformance in Ukraine, then would Ruben Vardanyan be able to compensate? Uh, on the other hand, uh, the story, you know, that Ruben being presumably a billionaire, you know, I have never seen him throwing around, you know, too much money. Frankly, uh, but okay, presumably he, he is rich. Uh, why would he need to come to a place as peripheral, frankly, you know, economically, subsidy dependent as Artsakh to increase his wealth? You know, so the, this something you know do, do, doesn't end up. What is most encouraging is how irritated Baku seems by his presence, because we finally get not just um, somebody who has an agenda, but somebody who has uh, superb uh, international connections. So if you feared that terrible Armenian diaspora, which in Baku uh, routinely goes, it is their cliche, which I admire very much, you know, the international gangster terrorist network called the Armenian diaspora. Well, then in Ruben, you got it. You know, so this is to remind you, you know, this is the man you know, who, yes, you know, through the Aurora Prize, you know, through his humanitarian initiatives, managed to uh, have excellent context uh, in the Western world. Uh, this is also the man who, uh, during the dangerous 1990s in Russia, demonstratively walked around without bodyguards, you know, being an investment banker. Uh, which was very unusual for Russia, you know, and that was a uh, very strong advertisement, if you wish. You know, so here he is one exceptional businessman. He is not under the threat of sanctions from the West, obviously. So when you start putting all these things together, you start, okay, wait a minute, you know, but what could be his motivation? Could it be that his grandparents are buried in the cemetery in Hadrut? That he really suffered psychologically during the War of 2020? Grievously, I have known Ruben uh, professionally, you know, so we met at business conferences once in a while you know, in, in the past, you know, we, uh, but we've never been uh, very close except for the dark, before the darkest hours of the war in Karabakh. I do remember him returning from Artsakh, you know, he was very close to the battlefront, uh, coming to my place 
and we would just sit and stare at each other. We didn't drink even uh, very much. You know, he he would might he might smoke his cigar because what was there to say? No, this is a mission. You know, so seriously, as a professor, I could have had much more comfortable life in some other quieter place. You know, I'm fluent in Portuguese, for instance. I could have afforded you know, a nice villa in Portuguese countryside to retire. Yet I'm here somehow. Uh, Ruben, trust me, <laughs> you know, he could have afforded you know, a Caribbean island. You know, something, anything in the world, you know, an apartment, modest apartment in Amsterdam would be quieter than, than Artsakh now. Yet he's doing this. So now what is he trying to do? Internationalize what he can do best, inter internationalize the conflict, you know, to bring wor the world attention to it. This is what Baku must fear and evidently they are not such dummies, you know, they fear it. You know, more attention to this conflict, this is why they are maneuvering. In, um, they are trying different attacks. In uh, September it was very brutal attack, not just a provocation at the border, but a very brutal attack that provoked very strong, surprisingly strong Western response. And now they are trying, you know, the kind of soft power. Uh, there is a, a Russian expression uh, in Baku dialect, you know, padlanku kinut, you know, to throw in uh, a piece of dirt, you know, some, uh, to sleep, you know, to throw in a uh, banana peel. Uh, so this is what is, uh, they, they are trying, this is what is, uh, is happening and the way to counter that is to be steadfast and this is what, uh, no concessions, because any concession in this kind of um, negotiation with Azerbaijan will bring for the intimidation, because the uh, ultimate goals of Azerbaijan are not just gigantic, this is the whole justification for the existence of this regime. Because otherwise, you know, so once they defeat all Armenians, you know, you turn back to your population and say, well, what should we do next? Uh, like, think about diversifying our economy? What? You know, so of course, you know, there must, uh, it is in the interest of uh, Aliyev's regime, not Azerbaijan as a country, his regime, you know, to continue with this red herring of Armenian threat. So that's endless. We should expect that it, it should continue for at least as long as the Aliyev regimes last. It could end next year. I do not exclude this, you know, there will be shock waves from the collapsing uh, big authoritarian regimes in Eurasia, and that might be not only in Moscow, that could be Iran. in Ankara, <coughs> Iran. it could be Iran, you know, there will be shock waves <coughs> over Asia. But we uh, must not be placing, you know, in Armenia, we are not placing hopes just in the shock waves. Armenia will be buoyed by those shock waves. Actually, Armenia will, like a good bolt, you know, it will survive. However, right now, you know, there must be a massive preparation for equally loud, uh, louder international campaign. So they are coming with soft power, we are coming with softer power. I'm going <clears> to <throat> close up this discussion with two, uh, what I call, uh, we'll, we'll deal with the negative, uh, it's a negative question and positive question. Uh, let's deal with the negative question. The worst scenario happens. There's a violent ethnic cleansing of Artsakh uh, because of either Russian cooperation or Russian weakness, whatever it is. Uh, the world does nothing, which is not that surprising. Uh, or maybe it is surprising, but we will find that out. What would such an event do to the politics of the region? One, what would it do to the internal politics of Armenia? And what would it do to the internal politics of Azerbaijan? First of all, you know, this is plausible. It's, I'm, I'm glad actually that we are discussing you know, such possibilities. Because few people in all the uh, noise that we observe both in, from the Azerbaijani side and from the Armenian side. A few people soberly discuss this. All right, Armenia would have to absorb probably 120,000 refugees. With a population nearing 3 million, it can. With the economy which is growing, yes, it can. This would please Azerbaijan, you know, like disappear from our territory. 
This would also uh, probably bankrupt uh, Azerbaijan because, let's face it, Karabakh will need to be subsidized economically forever. That's why so many brilliant people uh, over the last couple centuries, had, more than a couple centuries, had originated from Karabakh. Because this is typical stories of mountainous areas, like in Europe it is Scotland, it is the Basque country, uh, where people originate but never make their careers. You know, then they have to go to London or Paris or overseas to pursue their careers. And that's why so many brilliant Karabakhs all over the world. So Karabakh would have to be subsidized. However, uh, it will be um, a big shock for Armenian society. It could be healthy, actually. Uh, because obviously, uh, we have two kinds of uh, powers, the former power and the current power. Current power has been in power long enough to prove their naivete. Let's put it this way. Or their very strange um, inaction and a lot of speechifying at the same time. Uh, the uh, old power, I mean, you know, the, the previous three presidents, and this is, by the way, uh, already a very promising sign, you know, that four presidents are present, uh, are heads alive. of state, are here in Armenia at the same time. You know, which is not quite possible in the neighboring country. Uh, that the regi those regimes, you know, they have, they have had, you know, the, or the groups of those regimes, you know, they have had every chance and all the backing from foreign powers that they could have secured, and they have failed. You know, so that's a very hard proven failure. You know, so we have hard facts. Uh, remember. There is a social revolution happening in Armenia right now. Social, I mean, not politically social, but social shift. You know, that we have this new educated generation. Many of them are coming back. Many of them uh, could have been in Russia. You know, you just go and see what are the waiting lists for obtaining Armenian citizenship right now. And it would be a very good... Uh, journalistic and sociological tasks to see the quality, the human quality of those people in trying to uh, obtain Armenian citizenship. Even if they are not going to be immediately residents of Armenia, well, fine, you know, so they will become, we always need it, you know, them, you know, just to come and spend some time, maybe spend some money here. Uh, so we have this new generation and the realization that the world is not as, uh, how should I say, there are not very many uh, destinations in the world where you can flee at the moment, right? The world is in crisis. So why not just fortify this small Armenia? It's relatively easy to do because it's small, because we all know what, what needs to be done. We need that political will. So there could be actually a, uh, a catastrophe, you know, the, the erasure of Armenian Karabakh, which is a possibility. We are looking down a very dark alley. It is a possibility. Genocide could happen. Azerbaijan, not for any humanistic reasons, would, take, would prefer to avoid massive casualties simply because they might get away with that. Even with that, it would be very difficult to get away because it would be a quite blatant uh, violation of minority rights. Uh, it would be expelling you know people under duress of course you know they, they might try to mitigate it by paying a few armenians to stay as kind of token uh as a citizen uh, there will be uh, lots of dirty fighting you know, and dirty pr go going on around it uh you know, it's not so important actually you know what is important that in Armenia, this will produce a jolt, a jolt comparable to the revolution of 1988, revolution in human minds. Because before, I do remember 1980, very few people, you know, I was a student, I was an undergraduate, very few people could identify Karabakh on the map here or in Baku. In Baku, the joke, I've been visiting my old friends in Baku, and I do remember, you know, we're sitting it's a student company and somebody jokes, and those who get uh, B minus 
will be reassigned as students and after graduation will, will be received jobs in Stepanakert. And it was ha 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 because Stepanakert was like Kamchatka for them, you know, like far, far north somewhere. Um, this was not a desirable destination. This was not so, so important at the time. But in 1988, this became a Jerusalem of Armenian politics. You know, and by uh, mirror effect uh, for Azerbaijani politics. And, you know, then it cooled down in Armenia and in 2018, finally there was another revolution. So what is so incredible here is that revolutions happen. That revolution has been long in the preparation. Let me remind you what is now almost entirely forgotten, you know, that there were successful and very inspiring protests in Yerevan against the uh, energy price hikes in 2015. You know, those people are around. They kind of matured. They acquired bitter experience, but they also understand a few things about politics by now. So there is a pool, you know this better than I, you know, because I live mostly outside of Yerevan. So, you know, you are here, you speak Armenian, you're politically connected, you know, that there is a pool of, a very impressive pool of potential recruits into political positions, men, and I always uh, press this, also women in their 30s, early 40s, in their 20s, really. And we could see a real revolution in Armenian politics, you know, quite soon, especially when something as grievous as Karabakh happens, uh, the, the ethnic cleansing in Karabakh. Uh, let me uh, conclude by citing maybe an unlikely specialist in uh, building ethnic borders or national borders, uh, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Once, when he was asked, you know, why he did not conquer Austria, he left Austrian Germans outside Germany. So this is because the priority was building a German state, not German nation. You know, priority for Armenians is building Armenian national state. If there will be an Armenian national state, there will be Armenian national nation. In diaspora, in Armenia, there will be continued reproduction. There must be a successful Armenian state. And as to Karabakh, well, 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, nobody can be very sure about the effectiveness of the neighboring, not even states, territories in their coherence. Will Ruben Vardanyan and people like him be able to visit the grave sites of their grandparents? I'm almost certain that yes. Well, let's, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to close. We've talked about the negative, but let's talk about the, the positive. Uh, we know we always, uh, in this part of the world, the positive is always less popular to talk about. What is the positive scenario? Um, is uh, there's, uh, with a collapsing Russia or a weakening Russia, the West becomes the hegemon that establishes freezing of the current situation and peace and prevents ethnic cleansing and essentially enforces a cold peace that nobody likes and becomes the dominant player, uh, filling the gap uh, for Russia. What does that do to the politics in the region and these countries? I don't think that the West would stay the same West as we used to know it. And I don't think it would be just as detached as you just described. You know, because what you described is Kosovo or something in the Balkans. I don't think it's going to work. And again, you know, we might be facing, and that's the hope, a generational succession in the European Union. Because obviously, and the recent scandal in European Parliament, you know, just makes it very glaringly obvious, you know, how oil money could penetrate, you know. Uh, the Qatar, Azeris. Qatar, Azeris. Uh, so what is happening with, uh, with this Qatar gate, as it's already dubbed you know, in uh, Belgium, is very damaging uh, for Russia and for Azerbaijan, for all these oil exporters you know, who are trying you know, to arrive with huge cases of cash there and probably some others. European Union will have to strengthen itself. You know? So I know that many people doubt the prospects. It's kind of 
uh, this has been the game, you know, for the last the parallel game for the last 20 years. Probably when would the EU collapse? When would the euro collapse? Um, well, let me put it this way: you know, I once spoke in a closed conference. You know, this kind of closed conferences, you know, where people uh, ask, just call them Jack or Bob. <laughs> You know, it's this kind, you know. And let's say that my position is advising the president of my country. Uh, so I asked one of them, you know, so what is there for uh, your country in the EU? I said, what? Because we need to know history. Uh, there used to be very strong and very glorious uh, Renaissance republics of Venice and Florence. They became museums. They were pathbreakers of modern capitalism. You know, actually, what have paid for all that beauty of Renaissance? What kind of money flow and what kind of people paid for uh, San Marco Basilica? You know, and, and then, you know, why they lost it? You know, because much bigger powers like Spanish Empire, France, Ottoman Empire arose all around them. Said we are, we are not going to be dwarfed by America and China, and at that time it, it was Russia, you know, we're not going to allow ourselves in Europe just to become a museum, a tourist destination. So if they are going in the opposite direction, it's not only that they would have to have an active uh, financial and military uh, strategy. So people often in Armenia speak about acquiring geopolitical agency here. But so needs the EU or other European countries. You know, the war in Ukraine just proved brutally to them, you know, that they need to have um, a serious defense, uh, defense capability. By the way, you know, people don't pay much attention to what's happening in Japan, you know, which is very rapidly acquiring that, and even more successfully because it's a kind of unitary actor. It's uh, easier for the Japanese. Everything is there already. You know. Uh, they just need to pretend they are not doing this, you know, because it is against the post-war constitution of Japan. Uh, so the world is going in this more muscular direction, but I would say also there will, there will be a succession from military to policing. Because, uh, say, until the 19th century, majority of rioting, and rioting occurred in Western European capitals, as a historical sociology I can tell you, you know, we know the incidence of rioting in, in London or Paris to be pretty high. And then rioting died out by the mid-19th century everywhere. Popular riots, instead there would be petitions to parliament. And uh, during the riots, they would send dragoons or a bunch of musketeers. Well, think about the American Revolution, how that was starting. You know, and just, you know, red coats would arrive and shoot live bullets. And then there would be the police with buttons and the very famous, you know, British, very, uh, British policemen, you know, very um, famously, iconically, just asking the protesters, please uh, move on, move on. You know, so you've done your prote next protester. Is, is coming. So I think international relations are going to be much tighter policed than uh, militarily intervened, if you wish. This applies to Karabakh, and you just think about it. And so there should be no, uh, even no reasons for regional wars, which means that uh, the EU would have not just to proclaim its interest in the neighborhood, as they used to have its neighborhood, uh, they would have to actively go into this neighborhood. You know? So Ukraine from the neighborhood must come in, uh, the Balkans must, will, would have to come in, and the solution to the immigration crisis is to put in order North Africa and the Arab world. Like it or not, you know, so this is the good prospect. Karabakh is just a minor thing which would kind of automatically will sort itself out in such a configuration. Well, <clears throat> Professor Dariulian, thank you for joining us in this insightful conversation. Let's hope that we will see lots of encouraging and frightening shifts in the coming year. We will see a lot.